I want us to reflect on the birth of Jesus Christ that is recorded for us in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. You may turn there if you would like. I won't reread those verses. We have just read them together. But just for the few moments that remain to think about this incredible story about the birth of the Son of God in the little town of Bethlehem. We have a cliche, a cliche that I love to use, and it is this, truth is stranger than fiction. And that could not be more true than this story. The story of the incarnation of the Son of God, announcement made to a young virgin in Nazareth. She and her husband travel to um, the town of Bethlehem in the south, and there's no room for them in the inn. The baby is born and laid in a manger. We have all the markings of a great story. It's a story that's true. It actually happened. It's all real. The author, Luke, who records this, gives us all the details that make for a great story, and yet he does it with some simple brevity. Who, what, when, where, how, and why are all uh, written into this brief narrative. It's a story that comes to us with sharp contrasts, and that's what makes it so exciting. We see powerful Caesar Augustus on the throne in Rome, and we see the king of kings in the stable in Bethlehem. So I've entitled this message, Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. Let's think about the story. We have in two parts, we have the decree that Caesar gave, and then we have the situation in Bethlehem where the baby is born. The story begins like any good story in those days. And it tells us a lot about the time as Luke here records what those days were like when the Son of God was born. Israel was under Roman occupation and had been so since 63 BC. So for the better part of 60 years, a little less, they had been under Roman rule. This story actually doesn't begin in Bethlehem. It begins 1,400 miles to the east in the capital of Rome, our capital of the Roman Empire, the city of Rome, where Caesar Augustus sits upon the throne, emperor of the entire world. About the year 8 BC, he gives a decree that every citizen of his domain must go to their original city of habitation and there be registered. Caesar Augustus is the son um, of Julius Caesar's nephew. So anybody who's done any ancient history will know the story about Julius Caesar, his assassination, and so on and so forth. This boy, his name was Octavian. He was the grand nephew of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar appointed him, Octavian, as his son and heir to the throne. In 31 BC, Octavian goes to war against Mark Antony and Cleopatra and defeats them in battle. He assumes the throne and gains control of Rome. In 27 BC, the Roman Senate confers upon him the title Augustus, meaning exalted one, majestic, high, and highly revered. He takes to himself another title, Pontifex Maximus, high priest of the gods. Archaeology has given to us this description of Caesar Augustus, divine Augustus Caesar, son of a god, imperator of land and sea, the benefactor and savior of the whole world. He was, in his own mind's eye, God, and he had saved the world as he thought so. Caesar Augustus, not Julius Caesar, is the man to whom is credited the founder of the Roman Empire, and he was emperor of this domain. The text reinforces this very point. Twice it tells us that he was Caesar Augustus, that all the world should be registered. And again in verse 2 it says, or verse 3, and all, assuming all the world went to be registered. This is the king who is the king of the entire world, Caesar Augustus, Pontifex Maximus. Four times in our text, the word registered is used. The author, Luke, is telling a story and he's underscoring in four ways the importance of this event. The entire world was going to be registered. Everybody was, was part of this. Caesar was taking a census. Now, in other parts of his dominion, the census was for the part of military conscription. 
but he had given permission for the Jew, he had given exemption to the Jews from military service because you know the Jews, they were difficult to handle. For the Jews, at the least, the census was for the purpose of taxation. So what the author is telling us is that we are viewing here a subjugated people. The bitter uh, fly in the ointment, the smoke in the eyes, was taxation. Remember the test put to Jesus, who do we pay taxes to? Do we have to pay taxes to Caesar? This was the situation. It was a bitter pill for the Jews. The Jews could think of no worse sinner in their book than a tax collector, a Jewish tax collector like Zacchaeus, who would be willing to collect taxes for their Roman overlords. That was the situation in which the story takes place. Luke gives us another detail to give us a time frame. It was while Quirinius was governor of Syria. The head of each town must go to his hometown in order to be registered. He tells us about Joseph. Joseph who went up from Galilee from the town of Nazareth to Judea. As noted in the first message this morning, Joseph is in line to the throne, as we see here in our text, that he is of the house and lineage of David. But he lives in Nazareth, a small town in the north. The, the distance between Nazareth in the north to Bethlehem in the south was about 70 miles and would have taken some time and would have been rather discomforting for Mary, who was in her ninth uh, month, her final trimester. Nazareth is, um, was not a very significant town. It was a town that was in the middle of nowhere, we would say, secluded, unnoticed, situated on the eastern side of a hill, not situated on any trade routes of any kind. The Sea of Galilee lay 15 miles to the east, and the Mediterranean lay 20 miles to the west. Why was Joseph in Nazareth? Out of sight, out of mind. He was not one to contend with Caesar Augustus for the throne in Jerusalem. Herod was king in Jerusalem. Pontius Pilate would later come as a governor. But Joseph had made no intentions of claiming what was his by right, the throne of David. He would indeed remain in his carpenter's wood shop and make tables and stools and let bygones be bygones. So it was. But God intervened. God in his glory, God in his power had other plans for Joseph and Mary. Mary was pregnant. And it was indeed necessary that her baby be registered of the house and lineage of David in Bethlehem. Returning to Bethlehem was an ordeal. Any one of you women who have been pregnant can only imagine how that arduous journey would have taken them, how difficult being pregnant, whether she walked or whether she sat on a donkey, we do not know, or whether she rode in a cart of some sort. But unpleasant would be probably a little bit of an understatement. Returning to Bethlehem is where, that is the, um, where David himself was born. It was, uh, and Joseph being of the city of David had to be registered there, Bethlehem. Bethlehem brought up a lot of thoughts. It conjured up ancient prophecies. A very prophecy about a 600 years of age went like this, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Bethlehem. That word means house of bread, Bethlehem. It was a small little town, also a town of no, means, no great significance except for this fact, that David used to live in that town. Luke, who tells the story, tell, calls Bethlehem the city of David. So in your mind's eye, look back to a thousand years before this journey took place, and you see a little boy running through the streets on market or Sabbath day. And you hear his mother, David, David, he is the youngest of eight boys, David. His name means beloved. This is the town that David grew up in, and it would be called the city of David. David, you know, 
would become king in Israel, the greatest king Israel had ever known. But I want you for a moment to look a little bit further into the past. You see another, another young woman, a woman who's far too young to be a widow, but that is what she is. She would be David's great grandma. You know her name, Ruth. And you see Ruth entering the city, a widow, with, no, with an uncertain future. Time seemed to have stood still in that city. It had deep roots. It was the house of bread, and from it would come the bread of life. Joseph may not have clued in that it was necessary for Mary's child to be born in Bethlehem, but God knew. Prophecies had to be fulfilled. It was necessary that it be recorded that the baby born to Joseph was indeed Joseph's legal child and heir to the throne in Jerusalem. So by a unique hand of divine providence, a decree was issued about four or five years before the actual event took place. And we see here in our story, Joseph with his betrothed wife, Mary, good and pregnant, entering the little town of Bethlehem. What a contrast, sharp contrast between Caesar Augustus, Pontifex Maximus, the savior and God of the whole world, and the son of God. In the womb of his mother, Miriam, as they enter the city, Faith sees the unseen and rejoices at the hand of God. God was sending his son to be born in the city of David because he was of the house and lineage of David. Joseph's son wasn't just born under the law of Moses. He was born under the law of Rome. He would pay taxes to Caesar. But this story doesn't end here at this moment. For it comes now with greater wonder and awe as we see how it was that this child came into this world. Naturally, the village was packed with people. It was the registration. And everybody whose ancestral family was rooted in Bethlehem returned to Bethlehem to be registered. It appears that they are among the last to arrive in Bethlehem. And no wonder, for the trip would have taken them a little extra time Mary being pregnant. Considering that they weren't able to find any lodging with any family members, one has to wonder as we read this story whether any of Joseph's family remained in their ancestral city. For they are not lodged with family. There is no home to take them in. They appear as strangers in their ancient village. The inn was full the word simply means a lodging place. There may not even have been an inn there, but there was, there was no lodging places, no guest rooms available. And so they found a stable to put up in. And they were there for some days. Uh, the text does not tell us that, they, that she had her baby that night. It says in verse 6, and while they were there. They were there for some time waiting for their turn to come to be registered in the books of Rome. And so they took up residence in something of a stable of sorts, which, all to, which was not altogether uncommon. Servants slept in the stable quarters. Slaves step, slept in the stable quarters. And that's where they found a place to lie down. While she was there, the time came for her to give birth. She went into labor and gave birth to a healthy baby boy. The text describes her here as, him as her firstborn son, and it uses the definite pronouns the, her, her, her son, the firstborn. And that's, that's underlined here because what it's been, what's being told us is that her son is the one who is heir to Joseph's house because he's the firstborn son. He is heir to everything that Joseph was heir to. He would sit on his father's throne. We are told that she gave birth to her son, the firstborn. She wrapped him in swathing cloths, as would, would have been common, and she laid him in a manger 
a feeding trough. Joseph would have cleared it out and put in some nice, fresh, clean straw. And that's where they laid their little baby. And that's where he slept. Because there was no place for them in the inn. There's no vacancy. Why did it happen like this? This is God's only son. Couldn't he have devised some better way to introduce his son to the world? Why such humbleness, such ignominy and shame? How he came tells us why he came and for whom he came. There is always in scripture an agreement between the message and the method of salvation. That's what Paul underscored in 2 Corinthians. The Son of God came into the world in a state of humiliation because he came to carry our sins, sins that would humble him, sins that would crush his soul, sins that would set him upon a cross. And so the method and the message of salvation always agree. He was not born in a palace, but in a stable. He was not welcomed by important officials, but by beasts. He was not wrapped in fine linen, but swaddling cloths. He was not placed in a luxurious basket of gold, but laid in a rough manger. The accent in our text falls upon the last clause, because there was no place for him in the inn. He who one day would preach, blessed are the poor, must himself first become poor. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. He was born, or he was, he was born in the stable where servants slept, because he would be the servant of all servants a servant to the servants. The Messiah who is proclaimed in Isaiah as wonderful counselor and mighty God and king of kings is the one whom Isaiah calls the servant of rulers. He, though the prince of David, did not come to be served, but he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The message and the method agree the Son of God came to earth to be our servant. He would take off his robe and put on the robe of a servant to wash the feet of his very disciples. He came in a state of abject humility and lowliness because that was the message of the gospel, of God condescending so low as to take upon himself our filth, and be our savior. And we see as we conclude this text that what is underlined here, that there was no place for them in the inn, would become a testimony, a banner of his life. In a couple of years, two years, they're living in a home and we hear his father saying to his mom, Mary, Mary, we need to get out of here. It's not safe for us. We need to flee tonight. And under the cloak of darkness, Joseph, Mary, and the baby flee to Egypt. There was no place for them in Israel. They remain in Egypt for a couple years, and when news reaches them through an angel that Herod had died, um, they do not return to Bethlehem, their hometown, because there's no place for them in Judah. They find refuge in the secrecy of Nazareth, where he will grow up. He will learn the carpenter trade. But when he becomes a, a prophet, as he was, he had this to say, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown. There was no place for him in Nazareth anymore. He would say to the, to the disciples when they vowed to follow him wherever he went, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Remembering, no doubt, what his mom told him when he was a baby, 
Remember, Jesus, there was no place for you in Bethlehem. You were laid in a manger. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. There was no place for him amongst his own people. Jerusalem did not receive him. The Sadducees rejected him. The Pharisees rejected him. Everyone rejected him. Finally, events culminated in his death upon a cross, which poignantly signified that there was no place for him either on earth or in heaven. Both rejected him. Heaven and earth cursed him alike. The child that was born outside the city died outside the city. There was no place for him on earth or in heaven. But truth is stranger than fiction. They laid his lifeless corpse in a grave, and there was no place for him in the grave. It could not hold his body down and keep it in its iron grasp, for he rose victoriously the third day. He opened heaven with his blood, and there was a place for him. For when he died and gave up his final breath, the Father tore the curtain in two and welcomed the soul into heaven and said to his son, There is a place for you here at my right hand. And there he sits at this very moment while we sit here below. He sits upon a throne. There is a place for him in heaven at the right hand of God where he reigns with glory and might. The one who had no room available in the inn says to you, and he says to me, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. There is a place for you with Christ in heaven. Amen. Let us sing in response, infant.